Hey everyone, Brandon Plan here from Sense Talk. Just a little podcast update. After this episode, we will be taking a one week break to plan and prepare for the beginning slash resumption of the three major sports leagues. That's the NBA, MLB, and of course, the NHL. So we're planning a lot of fun stuff and be on the lookout because plenty is coming your way. So stay tuned and now enjoy episode number 16 with baseball legend Jerry Weinstein. Best of seven. Of this best of seven series. Of a best of seven series. Welcome to the best of seven podcast. Welcome to the Best of 7 Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Plant from Sense Talk. In episode number 16, we are so very happy to have baseball legend Jerry Weinstein join the show, but that interview will be taking place after the news of the week, and ladies and gentlemen, there's quite a bit of news this week, and let's start with the worst news of the week. 15 women who work for the Washington NFL team alleged sexual harassment by former scouts, high-level executives, and members of owner Daniel Snyder's inner circle. This report uh, was from the Washington Post, was dropped about an hour and a half, an hour ago, We'll link that in the description below, so do not worry. Now, we're not going to go into specific details because of how disturbing and misogynistic they are. But like I just said, in the YouTube description, the link will be there for you to read and read the disgusting things that have occurred within that organization. Now, let's start with uh, the facts. Larry Michael was the senior vice president of content and the voice of the Washington NFL team. Seven former employees said Michael routinely discussed the physical appearance of female colleagues in sexual and disparaging overtones. Alex Santos, the club's former director of pro personnel, was accused by six former employees and two reporters who cover the team of making inappropriate remarks about their bodies and asking them if they were romantically interested in him. Richard Mann II, former assistant director of pro personnel, has been alleged to have sexually harassed women repeatedly. This all happening under Dan Snyder's ownership. Dennis Green, former president of business operations, implored female sales staff, this is disgusting, to wear low-cut blouses, tight skirts, and flirt with wealthy suit holders, sweet holders, according to five former employees. Already I'm sick to my skin, and we still have about a page and a half to go. Just just the fact that this is happening in, a nas- any, in any work environment, to be quite frankly with you, is just disturbing. Mitch Gershman, former chief operating officer, or CF, COF, whatever, COO, verbally abused and sexually harassed multiple women, including M- Emily Applegate, an employee with the Washington uh, NFL team between 2014 and 2015. She was the one name out of the 15 uh, female former fi- uh, female employees that revealed their name. The other 14 wanted to remain anonymous, but good on her uh, for coming out with this story. Um, And hopefully we can see change with this. Now, I'm going to continue with more from the Washington Post article. According to the article, no woman accused Snyder or former longtime team president Bruce Allen of inappropriate behavior with women, but they expressed skepticism that men were unaware of the behavior they allege. No way they weren't aware. There's no way. If you're the owner of the team and in 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 the article itself, you should definitely check it out. In the article itself, it's very clear that Sexual exploitation of women is accepted and very well known. It, I find it hard to believe that Dan Snyder or Bruce Allen hasn't been a part of one conversation sexually exploiting or uh, obviously just saying disgusting things, uh, very provocative things about women. I'm, I'd be, I'd, I'd probably bet that I'm sure Dan Snyder or Bruce Allen, at least one of them knew, if not both. Uh, can't confirm that. Uh, that's just my opinion, though. I'm just going to state that for the record. That's my opinion. I think many of y'all that are watching this could definitely agree with that. Emily Applegate believes Bruce Allen knew, and this is what I'm trying to say. Emily Applegate, the one out of the 15 women that revealed her name, uh, she's saying that Bruce Allen knew, and this is what she said. I would assume Bruce knew, Bruce Allen being the person she's talking about, because he sat 30 feet away from me and saw me sobbing at my desk several times every week, which just speaks to character about what type of person Bruce Allen is. You saw a... a uh, a fellow employee crying at their desk and you don't even go there to ask what's going on you don't even call anyone you don't call hr well let's get to hr in a second because there's not much hr to call even in the washington organization but this alone just shows how messed up this organization is and i'm going to get to it later i really hope there's change in this organization according to three former executive members of the washington nfl team snyder routinely belittled top executives including dennis green making him do making him basically like a um a circus uh show uh the way he treated uh uh dennis green the former president of business operations was apparently very terrible and even some uh, uh of the former uh, co-workers uh felt um you know, bad for him, but of course, Dennis Green and his actions 
speak to the person he is. And regardless of the pressures that Dan Snyder put on Dennis Green, the one that was trying to sell this, the tickets, the suites and everything, doesn't matter. You can't, you, that's just disgusting. You don't do that. And um, I'm very happy people are finally speaking out about this. Now, part of the issue, for sure, was the lack of human resource resource employees within the organization. On to page two. We're not even we're not even to page two, ladies and gentlemen. This was a bombshell report. The Washington Post article states the team human resource staff consists of one full time staffer who also performs administrative duties at team headquarters, responsible for more than two hundred twenty full time employees, according to several former employees. So you got one you got one staff member taking care of two hundred twenty full time employees uh, on the HR department. There's one HR representative. In a National Football League organization that's been well known for misogynistic remarks and obviously the racist uh, logo and name itself. But this organization has had so many problems and the fact they only have one HR uh, representative speaks volumes to the real issue that's going on in that organization, which is a lack of accountability. There's no HR, said one former veteran female employee who left in 2019, and there was never a reporting process. Nor was one explained to new employees about how you shouldn't repeat something. Now let's talk about head coach Ron Rivera, who made some comments on some of the allegations. We're trying to create a new culture here. We're hoping to get people to understand that they need to judge us on where we are and where we're going as opposed to where we've been. And that those comments were taken from the Washington Post article. Those were more, I believe, about a couple of the firings earlier this week. I think Alex Santos included in that. Uh, I think he wasn't discussing the article itself, uh, but he was discussing a couple of the firings earlier this week from the allegations that some of the former employees faced. Now, Emily Applegate alleged in the Washington Post article that Gershman told Applegate never to wear flats, only heels, and suggested form-fitting dresses for nighttime events with premium clients. He also inquired about her dating life and expressed concern she didn't have a boyfriend, she said. In response to these bombshell allegations, minority shareholders of Washington's NFL team have hired the investment bank, Moe and company to vet buyers and to sell their stake in the team per a league source. These types of actions have no place in any work environment. I feel absolutely terrible. I feel absolutely terrible for these women, and I hope Dan Snyder is forced to sell the Washington NFL team. There is no way he didn't know about any of these sexual harassment incidents, incidences, in my opinion. And it's time the NFL holds him accountable for the, disturb, for the disturbing stories he's let happen under his ownership. I'm sure by our next episode in two weeks, we'll have a better idea of the future of Dan Snyder and the NFL franchise in Washington. It's truly barbaric. It's truly disgusting. There's no place for anything like this happening ever, specifically in a work environment. And, um, you know, the NFL has a chance to do something right. We spoke about that last week with Deshaun Jackson. Uh, they make a statement and they didn't. Let's see if they make one here. Uh, sexually exploiting your, 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 your female employees alone is enough, in my opinion, to get you booted as an owner, and then you just have all these incidences of just harassment, sexual harassment, harassment, just vulgar language. I think that's enough, in my opinion, but we'll see. Now, at the time of this recording, Thursday, July 16th, 2020, at around 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time, the NFL has yet to make a statement or comment on the article itself. So, uh, like I said previously, in the next couple of weeks, um, when we come back, uh, after our buy bi- our bye week, uh, whatever you want to call it, our week off, um, we're definitely going to have some more news on this, I'm sure, and we'll be sure to report that to you. Now, the only good news that came out of Washington this week was the Washington NFL team said it will retire the former name and logo. It's expected a new name and logo will be revealed before the NFL season begins. So, uh, if there's anything positive coming out of Washington this weekend, it was that. Now, uh, Cowboys Dak Prescott and the Cowboys... Uh, the quarterback Dak Prescott and the Cowboys itself... They couldn't reach an agreement before the Wednesday deadline, which means the quarterback will play the 2020 NFL season to the $31.4 million exclusive franchise tag, being, being one of the only quarterbacks in NFL history to play on a franchise tag one-year deal. Uh, so you know, many people are saying that the future of Dak Prescott with um, the Cowboys is in doubt. We'll see. Now next, Derrick Henry to the Titans. A four-year deal worth $50 million, $25.5 million guaranteed. Derrick Henry was a huge, huge aspect of the Titans' run last year. And uh, he, this contract should expire when he's about 28, 29 years old. So he'll be able to get one more payday before he likely retires. Now Miles Garrett, after... 
last season where he had that incident with Mason, Mason Rudolph, the, some call it, uh, well, it is, it's assault. Uh, he signed a $100 million extension guarantee with the Cleveland Browns, most for a defensive player. Miles Garrett con contract extension with the Cleveland Browns contains $100 million in total guarantees, the most ever paid for a defensive player. And according to league sources, $50 million, 50 million is guaranteed in the signing. Now, Chief star defensive tackle Chris Jones reaches a four-year deal worth up to $85 million. Uh, he was really good in the regular season, of course, in that Super Bowl. And it's another uh, solid piece added to that uh, Kansas City team. Now, the Braves reportedly have signed free agent outfielder Yasuel Pui. The free agent uh, outfielder is signing with the Atlanta Braves. Uh, uh, reportedly, last season, Pui hit 24 home runs, 84 RBIs, and had a 2.67 uh, batting average, so it still has a lot left to offer. Uh, I remember he was one of the most, um, you know, uh, scrutinized players in the league because he expressed himself hitting a home run. He threw the bat like Jose Bautista. But he is an electric player, and the Braves, who are already scary good now, could get much scary, even more scary good uh, if they sign him. Now, this agreement comes after Braves, Braves outfielder Nick Barkakis opted out of the 2020 MLB season earlier this month. So it's not shocking that uh, the Braves were looking to replace Markakis with another solid bat to keep their team well-rounded. Now, the deal has not been confirmed yet, so no, there's no salary numbers or years or anything, but it's looking like he will be an Atlanta Brave. Now, huge news for people here in Ottawa. Former Red Blacks, Ottawa Red Blacks quarterback, Henry Burrs to be inducted into the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. Burrs played his last three seasons in Ottawa, was a franchise first starting quarterback, and won a CFL championship in 2016. Congratulations to Henry Burrs. Smile and Hank, as we call him here. Never, ever see him without a smile on his face. Well deserved, and congratulations to you and your family. Now, Bobby Ryan, Stephen Johns, and Oscar Lindblom are the three nominees for the Bill Masterton Trophy. Um, and, you know, Bobby Ryan... Congratulations to him on being nominated after a hell of a comeback story, but Oscar Lindblom probably will win it and probably, deserve, I think, deserves to win it. Just, just a remarkable story uh, to, to beat the cancer and, you know, maybe he'll even come back uh, and return to play. I think Oscar Lindblom should definitely win this award, uh, but Bobby Ryan certainly shouldn't get no attention here. I think they're both well-deserving, but I think Oscar Lindblom probably wins it and probably deserves it a little more, but they both honestly deserve it. So honestly, I'm just happy they're both getting recognized. Um, it's great to see that. Now, Blackhawks right wing Dominic Kubuk, Kub can never say this, right, say this name, Black Blackhawks right winger Dominic Kubalik was named one of the three finalists for the Calder Trophy on Tuesday. Defenseman Quinn Hughes of the Canucks and Kale McCarr of Avalanche are the two other finalists. So congratulations to them. I'm sort of surprised that, um, you know, uh, Adam Fox wasn't mentioned in this. Uh, I had him on my fantasy team and he's a hell of a player. Very underrated. But that being said, Kubalik had a really good year and um, Hughes and Kale McCarr are fantastic. Uh, I'd probably say Quinn Hughes or McCarr uh, gets it. Probably Hughes, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Now, uh... I touched up on this on inter in on the internal budget uh, podcast with Brandon Mackey. Um, we will post a clip of that conversation on anti-Semitism next week uh, on Sendstock on YouTube. But I thought I'd mention it here too. So we discussed Steven Jackson, Malcolm Jenkins, and just the overall idea of anti-Semitism in today's world. And, you know, we I mentioned something that's very important. I think it's important that we all people that have faced acts of prejudice, acts of hate should fight and stand together. So when Malcolm Jenkins and Stephen Jackson are defending Deshaun Jackson's um, disgusting anti-Semitic claims and remarks and posts, it's disheartening, it's hurtful, and it's shameful. Um, I think it takes a lot away from Stephen Jackson, the good work he was doing for the Black Lives Matter movement, which of course I stand with. Um, same with Malcolm Jenkins. I think it was just, you know, rude and, like I said before, disheartening uh, the way he just brushed off the anti-Semitism issue. I think... You know, I think a lot of professional sports athletes, primarily in the NFL, um, you know, we've only seen Zach Banner and Julian Edelman and a couple other players speak out against this issue. And I don't think it's a Jewish hatred issue. I think it's a, a lack of education issue when it comes to Jewish issues. I think I would love to see NFL players speak out against anti-Semitism. I'd love to see players in all sports speak out against it. And I think, um, you know, uh, the fact that there are people openly defending Stephen Jacks, uh, Deshaun Jackson's claims, and there's people that are remaining silent and don't want to speak out on this issue. It's the problem. Uh, we're finally speaking about racism, and that's a great thing. It's a fantastic thing, and it's a thing that needed to be done for quite a long time. Now it's time that we start speaking about anti-Semitism. 
Jews for years and years and years have faced persecution for no reason. Jewish people, especially the last few years, have faced anti-Semitism every single day of their lives. In fact, on my video, when I commented on Deshaun Jackson's um, posts, I posted it a few days, uh, a week or two ago, a week ago, a week ago. Uh, I got a, a very vulgar anti-Semitic comment right away, which included the N-word, which of course was reported, and that person was blocked from my channel. Uh, we do not want that type of comments on my, my post, but I'm just trying to explain to you that I understand that many of you haven't seen anti-Semitism or haven't experienced it, because many of you aren't Jewish. So it's real, it's out there. Jewish people faced most anti-Semitic, um, hate, the most hate crimes in New York City last year. And once again, it's not a competition. All I'm trying to say is we need to band together, we need to unite together, and we all need to stand up against all acts of prejudice. So that's my little conversation there. We're going to make sure to post a conversation with Brandon Mackey from the Internal Budget Podcast, which, by the way, was a great conversation. Make sure to check out that episode. But we'll post that in the next week or so on YouTube at Sense Talk. And, of course, speaking of Sense Talk, just past 700 subscribers. I think we're at some 15, some 20 now. So thank you so much for the support. Uh, that video on the Sense rebrand... Um, if you're listening to this, make sure to check out that video after this podcast episode. The Sense 2D logo is back. Where is it? Right there. That logo is going to be coming back. So I had all plenty to say in that YouTube video. Now let's get to today's interview with Jerry Weinstein, the baseball legend. All right, we are joined here with Jerry Weinstein. Jerry, how are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Just just got done with a, another Zoom. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on. Now, with the first question, we're going to go way, way back to the beginning of your career, where you started your career at Sacramento City College, where you coached for 23 seasons and won 831 games. Your 98, pardon me, 88 and 98 teams won the state title and National Junior College Athletic Association Championship. Can you speak for a minute about what place in your heart that school has for you after being there for 23 years? Well, uh, if truth be told, uh, that's my best job because. Uh, it obviously, it was not my first job. I started out in like 1967 at well, actually 1966 at UCLA coaching the freshman. But uh, that was my first head uh, uh, community college job. What was that and, like for you? Oh, it was great because uh, you know when you're in a community college, you you do everything, and so yeah. success or failure is 100 percent in your corner, and and uh, so. Uh, uh, there's no pointing fingers and none of that. You, you you take care of everything. Now, obviously, we built a very substantial in, in infrastructure over the years and built a $5 million stadium with lots of assistance and lots of really outstanding players. But day one, it didn't start that way. Well, that's, that's fantastic. And speaking of fantastic things, you also served at, as the assistant coach for Team USA in the 92 Summer Olympics and coached Team USA in the 96 Summer Olympics. Along with, along with Skip Bertman, and the team won a bronze medal. What was that experience like winning an Olympic medal? Oh, that was great. Uh, one, one thing you need to understand, yeah. the coaches in the Olympics, they don't get anything. <laughs> you know, they coach the team, they don't get a medal. Really? Uh, the satisfaction of having – and you don't stand on the, the awards platform mm. the team does. And, uh, you know, basically it's a, it's a player-centered environment. But it was a very – it was a great experience because – we had a tremendous coaching staff and a great group of players. We had probably 20 plus number one draft picks. And so, uh, and, and having it in the United States in Atlanta was a, was an added uh, yeah. bonus. Now I, I just want to touch up on that fact that team coaches and stuff don't get medals. Uh, were, was that known before the Olympics started? And when that, when you won the bronze medal, was it sort of bittersweet to not get one of the medals? No, no, that was non-factor for me. That kind of stuff doesn't float my boat. And yes, we we did know that uh, okay. we were getting, plus the players got uh, compensated from the Olympic Committee for winning a medal, and, and the coaches got a small stipend. But neither neither of those factors were really important in the big scheme of things for me. Well, I think regardless of a bronze medal or anything like that, I think just the experience as a whole, being with so many elite players, <clears throat> and of course being a part of an Olympic team that won a medal. It's a story to tell for a lifetime. The story, I think, would be more valuable than the medal itself. Now, more recently, 
as you can see here, I'm wearing my Team Israel hat. You managed Very Team nice. Israel. That's, that's my favorite hat of all time. Love it. I love it. I've had it. I'm a huge fan. And I, I remember before I get to the little, I got a little question here. But before we get to it, I just want to touch up on it. I remember I, I used to wake up at like 4 o'clock in the morning here to watch you all play. And it's really, like I, get, like I said previously, it really is an honor to have you on. I'm a huge fan. Now, more recently, you managed Team Israel at the 2017 World Baseball Classic Qualifier, leading them to a perfect 3-0 record qualifying Israel for the first World Baseball Classic appearance. When you return as the manager for the main tournament, you managed Team Israel at the 2017 World Baseball Classic in South Korea and Japan in March 2017, where the team was 4-2 and two overall in the tournament, shocking everyone when finishing first in Pool A with a 3-0 record. I remember, like I said previously, I remember it like it was yesterday, watching Israel upset Korea in the opening game, the utter domination against Taiwan, and a thrilling win over Cuba. I don't know what it was about this team, but they, were, but y'all refused to quit. Josh Zide, Ryan LaVarnway, among others, pulled off incredible performances. As you can tell, this team has a special place in my heart, as I was proud to cheer for Israel. And more importantly, a team built full of Jews. What did it mean to you to manage an Israeli-slash-Jewish baseball team? Well, number one, we had a really good team. Yes. We had, we had some really good players, guys like Jason Marquis, who's been a Big league all star and a silver slugger winner and and uh, and Nate Fryman and and Ty Kelly and and uh, uh, it was it was a, it, yeah. it was a good it, they an underestimated team we were the so called uh, Jamaican bobsled team of the yeah. WBC but it was a, a tremendous experience uh, uh, especially <clears throat> I was. Uh, my intention was to manage the 2012 qualifier, mm -hmm. but I got a big league job with the Rockies at the time, and, and uh, Brad Osmus did it, and they were in the driver's seat and just got nosed out. Yeah. So we had a lot of guys on that 2016 qualifier that had uh, been on that 2012 team, and that really scarred some of those guys yeah. because that was very meaningful for them. And so I was glad to be in a position to help them uh, a qualify in Brooklyn, which was really a tremendous experience. Uh, there were we played uh, with the two teams we did play. We didn't play Pakistan, but we did play uh, Brazil, who had an outstanding yeah. team, and uh, really? Great Britain. Yeah, they had a really good team. We were very Close. fortunate to win that one, and it, that was a in itself was a tremendous experience. And then. Uh, and again, that was a team that was kind of pieced together over the course of 12 months because the qualifier was at the end of the minor league season. So professional, active professional players were not that enthusiastic about playing and, and organizations were definitely not anxious to release their pitchers who had just yeah. thrown 140 to 170 innings in the minor leagues to, uh, to team uh, Israel to compete in the, in the qualifier. So we were we were scuffling to get players and and um, we made a choice to to go with pretty much older guys and uh, pitching heavy because we thought matchups would be important especially with pitch counts and it, it worked out well for us and so then with, after qualifying <clears throat> and then qualifying for the actual competition we thought well it'll be a lot easier now because the player pool will will expand yeah. exponentially and we will have access to 40 man guys and, yeah. and we'll have a much better team, even though I was more than happy to, to take yeah. that team that we had in Brooklyn who that played their ass off and were very passionate about uh, playing a in the WBC and B, especially uh, representing Israel and all we could do for baseball in Israel in terms of creating some awareness and some revenue just by being in the, uh, in the qualifier and then for sure in the in the actual WBC but that was not going to be the case because we were in a, a pool that was in Asia right during spring training with a lot of our young guys who were 40 men guys just for the maybe for the first time and they're trying to create a, a, a an identity with their professional teams and then also farm directors and and uh, General managers were not willing to release players at that time, especially if they were in big league camp. So again, we're scuffling for players, and uh, which was not a, important for me because I was. It's it's always about the team in the moment, and it's not like <clears throat> we're playing in a 162 game schedule where the cream is always going to rise to the top. We're playing 
uh, three a three game series basically, and and we don't have to beat uh, Kershaw or beat Kershaw every night. We just have to beat him tonight. And, and baseball is a is a funny game, and uh, you never can tell what's going to happen. And so that proved to be the case. And again, the formula we used with having lots of of older pitching that were predictable. We knew what the back of their baseball card said, and they they played accordingly. And so we, especially in that first uh, 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 series of games yeah. in Seoul, uh, where we we really I think we, we really surprised uh, Korea. They were the the I think the number two Favorite. team in the world. Yeah. And they had we we knew they had the uh, O from. Uh, 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 he was a closer for I'm, I'm not I'm not sure who, but uh, we ended up with us with the Rockies in the next year. But anyway, we got through him and kept the game close, and we 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 eked out a run in extra innings, and uh, Zide came in and shut him down, and then we we boat raced Taiwan, who was very good, yes. and then we played uh, Netherlands. We played was it? Netherlands? Yeah, yeah. And they started nine big league players. Scope. Big, big players. I was I was shocked when I saw like Jonathan Scope on that team. I didn't realize how many MLB players had affiliation with uh, the country Netherlands. What was that? Well, like? they get a lot of they get a lot of Curacao players, which is which is uh, territory of the Netherlands. And so uh, I think I think um, well, we played the way we play, which was hard and consistent. We didn't make mistakes and we didn't give freebies away and. And I think maybe they took us slightly, but even if they didn't, uh, if they were not playing well at their at, at the high at their highest level, they weren't going to beat us. And we ended up beating them and winning the uh, the uh, that uh, pool. Yeah. And I, it was funny because we had qualified for the next pool, yeah. and uh, yeah. we did not need to win that game. As a matter of fact, I was contemplating, uh, well, well, we'll rest some guys and we'll be ready for. Uh, so we're ready to play in Tokyo, and and Nate Fish, who was one of our coaches, says, "You know that this game is worth I don't know. It was like three hundred. You win this pool, you get an extra three hundred thousand dollars. Huge. And that's we, huge, though. For, for pardon me. That's huge, though. For um, you know, uh, a, a a baseball organization that's very new and obviously underfunded compared to other sports in Israel, right? No, no doubt. They don't. They don't have one." Decent field. They were playing at Baptist Village, which is not even a a, a good JV field in the United States. And yeah. so we felt like, hey, we're going to, you know, that two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars goes a long way in a promoting the game over there, uh, developing uh, coaches and building facilities. And so we 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 made an about face, and well, we're going we're going to compete to win this game, and we did, and it worked out fine for us, and did not affect us one bit for the next tournament in Tokyo. And, you know, the one thing about the WBC that for me was very interesting was uh, how meaningful it was, A, to MLB. Uh, Our commissioner puts a high value on promoting the game globally, and probably the best tool that he has is that WBC. And the other thing that surprised me was uh, uh, how how nationalism affects how people play and and the fans. I mean, the fans in Seoul were crazy. The fans in Tokyo Japan. were crazy. Yeah. Uh, and, but, I mean, both places. And like, and the MLB promoted it like it was a World Series. Everything was first class. All our travel was first class. The hotels, uh, every, everything about it was first class. The, the And the global significance and coverage was something I'm not used to uh, after games talking to 100 to 300 uh, news people yeah. about the game. Uh, not that I have any problem with that, but it was something that you know, just the the overall importance and and uh, not only to uh, certainly Israel, but also Korea, Taiwan, and and the Netherlands, and they were it was significant for them as far as the playing. And then going to Tokyo, which was another unbelievable experience at Tokyo Dome, where fifty five thousand fans and organized chant and it was it was yeah. it was off the hook man it was really really good now walk me through that final strikeout with Josh Zayed against Korea 
I remember that huge fist bump that he had. And I think a lot of fellow Jews around the world have the same exact fist bump. Because going into the tournament, Israel was seen, Team Israel was seen to be the underdog, a team that can maybe make some noise but probably won't. And that opening game was a true testament to what Team Israel was about to accomplish. So what was – just walk me through the elation that you felt when Josh Side had that closing strikeout. Well, the first thing that you have to consider is that the, the getting to the WBC and qualifying was an accomplishment in, its, in itself. And, you know, lesser a lesser group would have thought, well, hey, we did that and, you know, we're not expect- – but our guys expected to win the WBC. Yeah. That w- we weren't just there to participate. We were there to win. And I think that's something to be said for the character of that group. Um, you know, as far as, as – I'm, I'm pretty low-key. Uh, you know, I'm a low high and high low guy and I don't get excited. And, and I think from an emotional standpoint, I think it was, and it, this is a player's game, you know, you win because you have good players. And, and I think, especially for a guy like Josh side, because I think that when they lost in, um, in, uh, Jupiter to Spain in 2012, that that hurt, that hurt him greatly. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, he said as much when we were in training camp in, in Hudson Valley before we, uh, we, we traveled down to Brooklyn to play the qualifier. And he gave a very impassioned speech about, you know, he never wanted anything more out of his baseball career. And he's, you know, first round pick, mm-hmm. Vanderbilt, pitched in the big leagues. You know, he's an accomplished guy. It's, mm-hmm. he, he's not just a, a, a regular guy. Uh, and so I think that for him, that was extremely meaningful. But he wasn't the only one. Yeah, of course I, not. And, you know, we had a bunch of guys. Now, we had some observant Jews that were really connected to Israel. But we yeah. had a bunch of what I call secular Jews who were playing because this, this is a great experience, great opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, we had a fair number of, of guys that were, you know, my, my, <laughs> my joke was, uh, well, what do you have to – because the, the qualifications to play for <clears throat> the WBC are a lot different than what it takes to play for the Olympics where yeah. you have to be a citizen. Yeah. And uh, so I, my joke was, well, if you like lox and bagels, that's good enough. And that's just a joke because in reality you have to have a, yeah. a parent or a grandparent who is, is Jewish. Yeah. And so we had a number that were uh, – their, their, their uh, fathers were – were, were not Jewish, but their mothers were, or they were not practicing Jews, had never been bar mitzvah, yeah. which is my case, pretty much. But uh, it was really meaningful to those guys as well, which I thought was uh, really pretty special. Now, I think, um, speaking of the special group that that, that, that team had, and I think uh, for a team that really exceeded expectations, you have to have a, a, a team and a group that's really – bonded and really close together now the mensch on the bench was a very very vocal story that came out of the world baseball classic which made a lot of people a fan of yours and of course your team speak to me about how that started and how that just kept on going throughout the tournament well that was a hundred percent cody decker (laughs) of course cody Cody brought that in and and cody was a a real team builder Mm -hmm. and a big personality and that was all his, that was his doing 100%. And uh, I, I'm, I can't take any credit for that, but it was impactful. And yeah. a lot of people, we had a lot of t-shirts and a lot of people talking about the mensch on the bench, but Cody Decker is your man on that one. And, uh, uh, you know, the thing that surprised me the most is mm-hmm. uh, how many people were paying attention to Team Israel and uh, it was kind of a double-edged sword when I got back. I said, oh, that was so great. But I'm really irritated at you because I lost sleep for about a week because we had to watch the game at 3 in the morning. But I know in our complex at uh, Salt River uh, that guys were really paying attention to it and watching it because uh, uh, our shortstop, Scotty Burcham, was a, was a low-A player in our organization. And, every, and he's a very lovable guy, and everybody liked him. And he was pivotal in, in some of our wins. And without him, we don't get there or win games. No, he, I got, got, yeah. he got the game-winning RBI against uh, Korea. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I got to ask a question. I think it's any podcaster would ask this when they have somebody of your level and statute on the show. Now, from 20, 2015, 2017, pardon me, to now, 
2017 was remarkable. We just had a whole thing about it. Now I'm wondering, let's move on to 2021. Will we be seeing you as a skipper for Team No, Ed? no, no. <laughs> I've, done, I've done my time and ah. time for I, – I think uh, if they had played this year, Sammy Full would have managed the team. Really? And, and hopefully he'll be able to do it. In, 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 there won't be a WBC next year. It'll be in 2022 because uh, the, next year's hopefully going to be an Olympic year. And then yeah. I'm, I'm tentatively on that Olympic sta- – U.S. Olympic staff, so that wouldn't – be, that'd be a conflict, but uh, I enjoyed my time. Uh, the the people that that uh, head the uh, Israeli uh, uh, group, uh, Peter Kurz and and his people have done an unbelievable job. They did a spectacular job to strategize to get the uh, team Israel qualified for the Olympics. That was unbelievable because he he was able to convince a lot of of the uh, baseball players, a lot who played for us and some who didn't to declare Aliyah and become Israeli citizens. And they, they were with the team all summer this summer that, that helped them qualify against uh, the European teams. Well, it is a shame that uh, you're not going to be the manager of the 2021 uh, World Baseball Classic. Um, you know, once again, I'm a huge fan of yours. And uh, as you can see with the hat and many fellow Jews, including myself, were just very – it was very emotional and powerful to have a team like Team Israel full of American Jews and, of course, a couple of Israelis um, do what they did. Now, let's take a look. We just sort of spoke about Tokyo, so let's get back to Tokyo. Team Israel shocked everybody, not only in 2017 going to the World Baseball Classic and then doing really well in the World Baseball Classic, but earlier this year, in 29, late 2019, Israel qualified for the Olympics. What are your thoughts about that? Well, that's that's mission impossible. That no. no way that can happen. But I think what happened. I think Peter did an unbelievable job of recruiting baseball players. They had a good team, and, and Eric Holtz, the guy who coached it, and Andrew Lorraine, and I think Nate Fish was with them, and Alone Leishman, and they did a phenomenal job. But they also did a tremendous job of putting the team together. And what happened? I think a lot of the European teams have not held uh, Team Israel in high esteem. Yeah. And I think they thought that they could just float through the qualifiers. And they had to win a significant yeah, number of games. It wasn't one tournament. They had to go through four or five different yeah. tournaments. I, I don't know exactly. I remember, yeah, uh, I, remember, I remember I was following that, like in Czech Republic, for example, they were, they were playing in there. Yeah, it, it, was, a whole, it was a whole process. And uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it, it, I'll let you finish, yeah. No, no, they had to go through a B pool and yeah. then an A pool and then the, the European Championships, yeah. in, uh, I believe, was in Italy. You know, and yeah. I think, and what happened is it's during the summer, so a lot of those teams played without their professional players. Yeah. That's not to diminish anything that they've done, but I think that they, I think they, they, they got the right people on the bus, and and maybe some of those other teams didn't. But but truth be told, they still beat them. And it didn't matter who they had on their team because um, the, they do have good players, even though they don't use all of their professional players. But I think that they were somewhat depleted relative to the, the professional players that they normally have access to. And then, and then Peter and his group really did an unbelievable job of putting the team together. And then they played outstanding and they coached outstanding. And, and that, for me, is a bigger shock, I'm sure, in, to European baseball that that was yeah. – that could that they never fathom the possibility of that being uh, uh, that happening, and and I, I think it's great. Well, after the World Baseball Classic, um, I did not. I was never going to write off. Well, actually, it's funny because I wrote an article. You know, I wrote like a blog about Team Israel uh, in 2017, where I'm like, I can see them squeezing into the second spot. You know, they're not. They got plenty of affiliate talent of major league baseball teams and they have the talent to surprise. And I mentioned that now I thought like we already said that 2017, a lot of people, um, you know, wrote them off. And in, in the qualifiers, I'm like, you know, it's, I felt it was unlikely, but I really did feel that there's a chance. And when they really got that final out, I think they were, they were up by quite a amount a big, a large amount of runs. It was like, they called the game early because they were up that much. And then they got that final out. Just elation, just elation. Now I'm wondering, 
like we already spoke about the three hundred thousand extra dollars that have been, that's been given to promoting the game of baseball in Israel uh, after winning Pool A. I'm wondering if you've seen the growth in baseball's popularity in Israel to your success at the w, WBC and of course Israel qualifying for the Tokyo Olympic Games. You know, I can't answer that. Uh, you'd have to talk because to, I, I have I have really not been in touch with them uh, too much, and I don't know how many more players there are. There just aren't enough. There aren't enough. Yeah. Uh, it's playing baseball in in uh, Israel. Uh, uh, there aren't enough facilities, uh, and I think that certainly the WBC kickstarted the process. But I think the Olympics will really because yeah. they'll get they'll be able to get some national money yes. from the Olympic Committee to support the uh, the the Israel baseball team. And I think that once they do that, then then they can really make a concerted effort to grow the game in Israel, uh, train coaches who train players and build more facilities. And uh, I think really, if you're going to be successful, um, you know, the goal someday, and this is in probably the, the, the future, and I'm not sure how far away it is, is to build baseball in Israel like uh, we built soccer in the United States. And it has to be from the ground up. The foundation you have to have a broad base. You have to have a lot of young kids playing. And ideally, you want Israelis playing yeah. for Israel. You don't want not, American, not American Jews. Yeah. Right. And there's and believe no, me, no there's, issues. Just yeah. But I, I mean, those all those guys that declared Aliyah, God bless them, and yeah. and they're and they're Israeli citizens, and hopefully they will relocate to Israel, yeah. and they would be the greatest proponents and and uh, promoters of the game if they lived in Israel and coach teams and coach coaches. That's what you're looking for, but I, I'm I'm thinking that a, a percentage of them I can't say how many will certainly be there for a portion of the year, but mostly live in the United States. And what you need to have is more of a baseball presence, more baseball people there, because right now yeah. uh, there are like three or four people uh, in, that administer the program in in Israel, and they're trying to do, do it all, yeah. and they they just it can't be done that way if you're going to grow it like we grew soccer in the United States, but then again, we're dealing with a larger population and uh, the demographics of our population with, with a lot of uh, uh, Hispanics in the United States that are born and bred on soccer. I think that certainly helped, but, but it's been embraced by men and women in the United States of, of all uh, nationalities. Now let's move on uh, from the topic of Israel, uh, Team Israel, and the WEC, and of course the Olympics, to discussing your career again. Now, you're a member of the Sacramento City College Athletic Hall of Fame, the, Cal the California Community College Hall of Fame, and the American Baseball Coaches Association Hall of Fame. You're also inducted to the base Sacramento Baseball Hall of Fame in 2017. And in 2018, you would receive the Baseball America's Tony Gwynn Lifetime Achievement Award. How does it feel to be recognized as not only a longtime legendary manager, but also the man who helped bring Team Israel into baseball relevance. Well, I'm, I'm somewhat embarrassed. It's kind of humbling. Uh, you know, I was kind of, I'm kind of like the caboose. I just kind of hitch my wagon on to good players, and and they, they do the rest. Uh, uh, I, I spent that Tony Gwynn Award. I said I got the Tony Gwynn Award. I said, I said yeah. He says uh, you're the. I think I'm the was the third recipient, and the first one was Cal Ripken. And the, the next one was Tom Kochman, who's a tremendous baseball guy, was with the Angels for a long time. And, and I said, nah, that doesn't compute, I, I, you know, in my resume compared to those guys. I said, but, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm gratified and, and, and very humbled to receive it, but uh, somewhat, uh, <laughs> somewhat embarrassed because, uh, you know, for me, it's always pretty much about the mm -hmm. players. Well, a humbling answer from a humbling coach. Now, in 98, you co-authored you co -authored Baseball's Coach Survival Guide, Practical Techniques and Materials for Building an Effective Program and a Winning Team with Tom Alston, and has received an average of four stars and above uh, average ratings across multiple platforms. Have you ever thought of uh, writing another book? I've written six books. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, one, one. Chief Editor, no allude, and you got to do better research, my friend. <laughs> yeah, the, the one that probably is uh is uh my my number one book is i wrote a book on catching uh and and uh, that's probably 
and, and I'm just doing the second, working on the second edition right, right. now. Yeah, so that's, yeah, I've, I've done, I, I do a lot of writing. I, I, I try and get stuff out there. I'm trying to help people. Just, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have all the answers, but I just kind of throw stuff out. And that's one of the things with the, the Twitter, which mm -hmm. I was, was, a, was a neophyte in Twitter. And, mm -hmm. and I, wrote, I wrote the catching book. And, uh, and a friend of mine, Alan Jager, who's uh, he's a noted uh, baseball guy in his own right. He does a lot of stuff on long toss and throwing and so on. And, he's, and I'd written the book, and he got the book. He says, yeah, this is really good. He says, uh, do you have a website? I said, no. He says, uh, do, do, you, do you have a Twitter account? I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. He says, uh, you're a dinosaur. And this was probably, I'm going to say, six or seven years ago. And so he says, hey, I'm going to set you up. And he set me up. And I just kind of experimented and learned how to embed video and stuff like that. But I was just kind of putting a little something out of the book every day. And then pretty soon people started asking me questions outside of catching and other things. And I started putting more and more. And I started to get more and more feedback. And, uh, you know, I felt like, well, hey, I, this, you know, this is kind of payback time. You know, people have really helped me. And. I've been doing this over 60 years and now it's time to pay back and, uh, and try and do some things. You know, it seems like it's, this has been positive and, and people are, are, uh, are receiving this uh, in a positive way. And, and this is information that, you know, I, I don't have any secrets and there's no secrets in this game. And, you know, you know I'm about baseball and, and making people better and yeah. coaches or players, whatever it happens to be. And, and uh, I don't want to, come out, come on as the smartest guy in the room. I'm not, I'm just giving you my opinions. This is not a sermon on the mount or etched in stone. It's just some stuff that I've, and I've made more mistakes in baseball than anybody. Cause I've probably been coaching teams longer than anybody. Cause I, and I always, when I was playing, I always worked for a recreation department and coached a team mm -hmm. from 15 years on. And so, uh, that's over 60 years now. And so, uh, I, I've screwed a lot of players up and I've helped some and, and I've made a lot of mistakes and you learn. You learn. Through, yeah. Yeah. You learn through your mistakes. And, you know, I love that you answered my second question here because I was about to actually ask about your Twitter account, which, by the way, everyone listening and watching, at J1 Catching is the at to make sure they give it a follow. Um, a lot of insightful baseball information there. Now let's move on. What advice would you give to any young coaches who want to improve their coaching or any young kid who wants to get into baseball? Well, uh, number one, information is king. Yeah. And this is a this is a, a an era where uh, there's a lot of information readily available. Some of it's good, some of it's average, some of it's not so yeah. good. And the more information you have, and if you have a good filter, uh, there's uh, this is a this is the information age of baseball. We've really taken a quantum leap yeah. in terms of analytics and and biomechanics and and analysis. And I think that. Uh, uh, you know, again, and then if you're a coach, surround yourself with good people. Uh, that means players and other coaches, assistants that help you or, or reach out. I think it, you know, people are really accessible today, and you, know, you can cold call like you did. I don't know who you are. You call me, hey, you got this podcast. Oh, all right. Yeah. You know, so you, there's no telling. If you dial Joe, get Joe Madden's number and call him, he may talk to you. Who knows? Yeah. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Now, I'm wondering – you know, as a as a baseball player myself, I do appreciate that. And, you know, uh, my friend, the chief editor, No Luden, we've been playing baseball for uh, a good part of our life. And it's, um, you know, it's we're, we're very happy to see the 2020 MLBC season beginning very soon. Now, what are your overall thoughts on the system that Commissioner Manfred and the MLB have put in place? Uh, what do you think about uh, the 2020 season? Uh, that's going to be shortened, obviously, because of COVID-19. Well, I'm a big fan of our commissioner. I think he's he's in a very difficult situation, and and uh, you know he's trying to represent owners and represent players and do what's right for the game. He's a steward of the game, and I think that we're keeping our fingers crossed because uh, a lot of the things that are happening in today's world are out of our control. And hopefully, uh, I know that they have a tremendous plan in place because uh, I know our trainer Keith Duggar was. Uh, one of the architects of this safety plan. And uh, I think that obviously it, there's a learning curve involved because you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have to deal with some 
situations that you didn't anticipate, but this is a, it's a time of adaptation and adjustment, just like players have to do when they're playing and developing their skills. And during ball games, I think the same thing's going to happen. And uh, uh, hopefully, I think that I, I talked to him today and he said, I, I said, things look good. He says, we've gone five days without a positive good. test. So that's great. And so I have my fingers crossed. I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, because be. uh, I think uh, you've got 30 teams in play. Yeah. I think with uh, with a short season like that, uh, Very predictable. there's no, no, no telling what's going to happen because the, the preparation aspect of the game, it's so different and, and we don't know how it's going to affect each individual player. Now, I think that's a great segue into my next question. As the pitching coach, as one of the pitching coaches for the Colorado Rockies, I was, exp- I was wondering what your expectations are for the Rockies going into a shortened season with a lot of turmoil in the locker room that is being rumored around. Uh, I'm just wondering what you're thinking uh, about the Rockies going into this season. Well, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not a pitching coach for the Rockies, but no. uh, you know, I primarily work uh, at the uh, – uh, for the, the, the farm director, whatever he needs me to do. I do a little of, of everything that I do scouting for Bill Schmidt or our scouting director, as well as Zach Wilson, our farm director. But um, our, my, if I were sitting in that dugout, my expectation would be to win it all. There's no reason why we can't win it all. We play in Colorado. We've got probably, the, if not the best, one of the best offensive teams in baseball. Yeah. We've got pitching depth, some young guys and some emerging guys. And, and again, it's a, it's a short season, and uh, you know it's it'll be it'll be a, a different uh, environment with the yeah. DH and every game. I mean, it's about tonight's game. You can't yeah. you can't. Well, you know, we'll kind of coast tonight because we got to prepare for whatever. Yeah. And the, with expanded rosters mm-hmm. and uh, and the COVID uh, piece, not knowing exactly. You got a starting pitcher, and all of a sudden he's tested on that day, and he comes up positive, or it's inconclusive, and now you got to make an adjustment. You got to spend bullpen, and yeah. it's it 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 will be different. But I like our I like our chances a lot. And now you touched up on the universal DH. I was wondering, as somebody who's been in the game for quite a long time, what do you think of the universal DH, and do you think it stays in Major League Baseball moving forward? Well, from a managing standpoint. And being a National League guy, I'm not a, not a fan. Yeah. But from a baseball fan standpoint, and being a fan where there's going to be more offense, potential for more offense, yeah. at least you would think that that 11% of the offense that's represented by the DH instead of the pitcher or a pinch hitter is going to be better and produce more runs. I like I like fast games with a lot of scoring. I, I don't I don't know many people who don't. Um, and, you know, another thing that the Major League Baseball is putting into play in the season, which we've seen here in Ottawa with the Ottawa champions of the Can-Am League, is an automatic runner at second base in extra innings. So 10 to 10th inning and above, uh, you'll see a man at second base, uh, which would help speed up the games. So what are your, uh, your thoughts on that? And um, I'm not a fan of it continuing moving forward. Uh, I saw it in Ottawa in the Can-Am League. It's not that fun. Um, you know, I think as a baseball fundamentalist, you know, I, I like the DH, but at the at same time, you have to get the guy on second. You can't just put him there automatically as a rule. I don't like it. So I was wondering what you think. Well, and that's part of the international tiebreaker. So we had it in the WBC yeah. and, um, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to wait and see, uh, gut feel is I like it because it in- introduces another element of decision-making uh in both dugouts as a as an offensive team do you bunt him over do you take three whacks at it and try and drive him in uh as a defensive team do you do you walk the guy and set up the force at third base in case they bunt uh i i think that there's an element of strategy that uh you you don't know where you're going to be in your lineup at that time you know are you going to be at the bottom of your lineup are you going to use some pinch hitters there or are you going to use you keep a designated runner like a Terrence Gore on your roster. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it's you're on DEFCON 4 in, in those situations. I think from the, for the fans, I think it's great. I think the fact that uh, we've got a uh, uh, pitching staffs that are not as conditioned as we'd like them to be relative to longevity in games and pitch counts, 
that not playing an 18 inning game and then having to come out and play that. Not that you can't play an 18 inning game with with a runner on second, but yeah, it's less just, likely to have, it'll, yeah, it'll be less long, mm-hmm. fewer. Not that there won't be any, but there'll be fewer long extra inning games that which can is, kind of decimate your pitching staff. Which is exactly like you said, exactly. It's exactly what Major League Baseball and a lot of its fans are looking for: shortened games because um, you know the games can prolong for four hours. And you know, I love baseball more than the other the next guy or girl. But at the same time, I don't got time to sit for five hours and watch a game. So I understand it, but at the same time, like you said, we're gonna have to wait and see how it goes. And if it goes well, maybe my opinion will change. But right now, I'm not the biggest fan. Now, I'm wondering, besides the Colorado Rockies, who you already touched up on, I was wondering if you have seen any teams who you think will, uh, you know, shock or sub- surprise people in the shortened season. Well, like I said, I, I think there are 30 teams in play. Yeah. That includes Baltimore Orioles and whoever you want. Miami, yeah. And, and I, that's, not a, that's not a slam on the Baltimore Orioles, but over 162 games, if they had to play in the American League East, yeah. chances are – they're not going to win, and they're probably not going to. They're not going to be a uh, a wild card team, but they can certainly win or be be a wild card team. Even though chances are a wild card team probably doesn't come out of the the American League East unless yeah. unless. Well, yeah, I, I shouldn't say that because Tampa Bay and the Yankees yeah. have done that pretty consistently, and and Red Sox uh, too. pardon me, and the Red Sox too, yeah, and the, and the Red Sox, yeah. Yeah. Now I'm wondering, like we 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 spoke about it a few times now, um, in such a shortened year, it's so everything's so up in the air. So I'm wondering, as somebody who scouts baseball, who knows baseball inside and out, if you have to guess, I'm I'm just asking, who do you think comes out of the AL and the NL for the World Series? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's I, I never I don't even think about that to be yeah. quite honest you would but you you would if you had to list one team out of the American League you'd probably say the Yankees out out of the American League and yeah. and I think the the National League is really really up for okay. grabs I mean a lot of people would say the Dodgers but the Dodgers lost David Price and they lost uh, 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 another pitcher as well I can't think of it and Tim Yeda went to uh, Minnesota if that's who you're thinking well no no they a guy they signed as a free agent oh okay. Anyway, but that's neither here nor there. But uh, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a, you know, I, I would say you would I mean, if if people had to handicap them right now, they would say it would be a Yankee Dodger World yeah. Series. But I'd bet anything, it's not going to be a Yankee Dodger World Series. Well, well, we'll have to see. Now, one last question: Do you have a message for Team Israel fans in the 2021 World Baseball Classic and in 2022 Tokyo Olympic Games? Well, uh, if you want to do something besides root for uh, uh, Team Israel, donate money to baseball in Israel. Mm-hmm. That's a great message. That's a great message, and that's a great way to leave it off. So, Jerry Weinstein, thank you so much for joining. Like I said previously, I'll say it again, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Big time, long time fan, and I wish you nothing but success in the future. And, of course, to stay safe during a scary time like this. So, thank you so Thanks much. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it, Jerry. All right, buddy. Take care. See you. Bye. So that was baseball legend and professional baseball coach and scout of the Colorado Rockies, Jerry Weinstein. So thank you so much, Jerry, for joining the show. You're welcome back anytime. It was an absolute honor and privilege to have you on. Now, before we take our week hiatus or break uh, to prepare for three sports leagues returning to play and or starting the season, uh, we would like to let you know where to follow us on social media. So be sure to check us out on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Sinstock Podcast. And as well, be sure to check out my personal Twitter account at Sinstock underscore. Shoot me a tweet or DM and I'll make sure to reply to you as soon as possible. We really do appreciate the support so thank you. Uh, of course, make sure to check us out on all five official streaming platforms of the Best of 7 Podcasts. That's on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and of, SoundCloud, and of course, YouTube. Click that red button and make it great and subscribe to us. We just passed 700 subscribers so I really appreciate the support and we will see you in a couple of weeks when we return and have a nice plan in place to bring you the best content possible. So have a safe couple of weeks and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Have a great couple of weeks.